I'm going to restart this and just let it run through um, for those of you who are just arriving to get our leisurely start uh, to the day. Um, we've been talking about fluid pressures at a point, as you know, uh, for this week, and that's what uh, the final uh, two classes today and on Friday will be. Um, and this is a prelude to being able to calculate forces and stresses acting on structures like uh, balloons or like airplanes or like dams. Um, uh, and so we need to first know how fluids uh, pressures vary at a point. Uh, that's what we dealt with the other day. We know that for liquids, they are largely incompressible and the density doesn't change very much as a function of pressure. And so we can take density as being constant. Uh, but for gases, of which air is what, 90% nitrogen, less than 10% oxygen. Um, all gases are compressible. Their modulus is given by the pressure. So the modulus of air around us right now is 101 kPa. Uh, its compressibility is 1 over 101 kPa, reciprocal. Um, and we know that because they're compressible, at higher pressures they're more dense and at lower pressures they're less dense. And we looked last time at the form of the uh, pressure distribution as you go up in the atmosphere. And of course this has a relevance to that because this is launching a, uh, uh, a helium balloon, I presume, uh, into the atmosphere. Quite clever, I think, actually, right? It's just a meteorological balloon. It's a loose uh, skin that has helium in it. You attach a GoPro or, and a telephone to it, maybe. Uh, let it go up into the, the sky and at some stage uh, the balloon expands because the pressure is reduced and the gas expands. The pressure in the balloon has to be the same as the pressure outside because the, the balloon has really no rigidity to change that and at some stage the balloon shatters and then the, uh, the GoPro and the phone come back to, to, to earth and the utility of that is that as it comes back to earth on a parachute uh, you use GPS to track it, which is what they're doing here. Uh, I don't know if you saw the balloon explode. Uh, there was a camera that was looking up into it, maybe. Maybe I was too busy talking and missed it, or perhaps it's in a different frame. Uh, it's in the Bay Area, launched by, by the looks of it from um, San Francisco, Golden Gate Park in San Francisco, if you've ever been there, on the south side of the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, and then once the balloon pops, uh, it comes down in a parachute. And I presume most of the drift is with the balloon before it pops, uh, and less of a drift after it uh, descends on the parachute. And actually, it's quite amazing that uh, with relatively low tech uh, things like a, a GoPro, I guess you could even use the uh, camera on the phone if you wanted to, if you orient it properly. Here, it's going to go. So the balloon, you saw when it uh, was launched, it was a meter or two, you know, in comparison to the people hanging around it. 33 meters, it can't expand anymore, and it shatters. It shatters kind of unstably into shards. Kind of interesting slow-mo picture of it all basically um, deteriorating into ribbons. Parachute comes out, and the, the GoPro floats down, and you hope to be able to retrieve it by using the GPS attached. I guess you could use find my phone or something at the, uh, or something more sophisticated than that, but you could certainly use find my phone. So I guess a consequence of some of the things we've talked about in this class. One, that pressures change with elevation. In gases, they change non-linearly. It doesn't affect this, but it, it, it would affect your prediction of when the balloon would burst. Uh, the pressure in a balloon, which has no real rigidity to it, has to be the same as the pressure outside. And so it will expand as you go up because you have the same mass that's included in it. Uh, if the same mass is included but the volume is increasing, then the density of the gas has to be uh, decreasing because density is mass divided by volume. Mass is constant, volume of the balloon is increasing. Um, the density of the balloon is what's carrying it aloft. And of course the differential density between the helium in the balloon and the air outside is what carries it up. And so that's all related, of course, to the, the ideal gas law as well, which we've talked about. And so that kind of epitomizes some of the things that we've uh, been talking about. And I guess this is going to find it. These guys, 
are looking for it, the balloon, they found it in someone's field. It must, I don't know what time of, of day this, of year this must be in California, but if, the, uh, if you spent any time in California, you know that the grass is green in March because of the winter rains, but as soon as April comes, it's brown. And so it's sometime before March, I, I would uh, imagine, just from the, the topography and the vegetation, I guess, more than the topography. So, so that epitomizes some of the things that we've been talking about. You know, something other that, else that we'll talk about today is this. Uh, relevant today because, of course, we know from uh, weather forecasts, we talk about low pressures and high pressures uh, regions. How do we measure that low pressure or high pressure? It doesn't really feel very different to us because the changes are relatively small. Probably about a tenth of the atmospheric pressure. So a very low hurricane has a uh, one atmosphere uh, the, the low goes down to 0.9 of an atmosphere, so 0.9 of a bar, so 0.9 times 100 kilopascals, so about 10 kilopascals difference is a, a very low low at the low of the lowest hurricane and a regular atmospheric pressure around us. And so one way to be able to, to uh, measure that is through using a barometer, and a barometer works on, on a principle that we'll talk about today which is just related to the vapor pressure of the material that's in it, because at the top of the barometer, um, the uh, liquid, mercury in this particular case, cavitates, and it becomes a vapor, uh, a mercury vapor in the top. And so we'll get back to that in, in due course. So that's kind of where we're going today. Uh, as normal, maybe we'll start with a bit of a, a recap on some of the things that we've talked about so far, um, shown here, hopefully everything works. So um, I hope you're appreciative. I, I'll, I will make the point that you know, we went through some equations yesterday. They're pretty short this, uh, or on, on Monday. And so if you look through the notes for the stuff for 2.1, it's uh, a little more intense than what we went through. So we went through the bare minimum. And we're not really worried about the derivation per se. We're worried, this is all the stuff that we did on Monday, but we didn't do it. We just did it in longhand with me writing a few things on the, on the screen. Uh, all this stuff we covered just by, by writing in, in, in reasonably short order. The only important feature to come out of this is we ended up with this expression here. I'm thankful for whoever told me that the negative sign was ahead of this equation. So this is the equ three equations that we came up with last time in shorthand, this was the minus sign that was mentioned at the end of class. If we write this out in longhand, you see that just for this bottom equation, it would transform to something like change in pressure with elevation, negative, this one here times this, minus one times unit weight, and it's written equals density times acceleration in the z direction. So these three equations look like this. We had them yesterday, uh, Monday. Uh, we had equals zero, and this was a negative before, but it's the same equation. And it's just a compact way of, of writing it. We will use this whole equation when we talk about accelerations. But for now, we're happy to define that accelerations are zero. So this term here doesn't matter at all. And under those conditions, a couple of important results come out. The first is uh, that as you go horizontally within a fluid, the pressures don't change. We talked about that being important when we did the, um, the capillary tube. We could go from atmospheric on the side down into the fluid and up into the capillary tube. The same level, the fluid pressures have to be the same, atmospheric. So we could cut it off at the bottom and do a free body diagram of holding that column of water up, which is basically what the solution was. And the other important result that comes out of it that's always true, independent of the fluid, whether it's compressible or incompressible, is that the pressure change with elevation is equal, that gradient is equal to the unit weight, which is also equal to minus rho times g, just by our definition, our, our way of defining it. And so all that changes when we deal with that is that this absolutely is true, but when we want to rearrange this and integrate it, so we take this expression here and we write it as 
this, and then we do this. That's what we did in both cases. We end up with these two equations here. And they give us how fluid pressures change with time. Because the density, or well, the unit weight, doesn't change of an incompressible fluid, a liquid in other words. Well, you see there, water for instance. Then we just get this simple relationship. We choose to take Z as positive upwards, but if you measure it as depth, which you probably will do, depth is positive going downwards. So we make a distinction between Z, which is a coordinate, X, Y, Z in right-hand coordinate system, and H, which just is a depth. So we know that if you look at a, an incompressible fluid, and if you look at how uh, pressure changes with negative depth, then we know that from some value of P here, P zero in this curve, I guess, to get to P, then this term here is just H. Right? So this is what this expression is. So you'll use this expression 90% of the time. You need to be mindful of whether the fluids are compressible or incompressible. Um, but if you're using it on liquids, any liquids, then you'll be using this expression. If we use this expression on a uh, gas, then because the unit weight isn't constant, in fact, it's a function, so the unit weight is equal to density times G. And so we can use the ideal gas law for, for density, which is just going to be P over RT times G. This is this term here. It's negative. So because this factor is a function of P, we had to do some manipulation, and the integral ended up being a bit more complicated. So that's uh, what, where we dealt with yesterday. And the, I guess the take-home message from it was basically this figure that we, draw, we drew last time. I'll make this smaller because my pen looks like a blunt instrument when I use it this way. And you'll remember that if this is pressure, if this is elevation, if this is the ocean, then this term here is P is equal to P0 plus gamma H, this term here. And we know that if this is gauge pressure, then this would be um, one, uh, if this is gauge pressure, this would be zero, but if it's absolute pressure, it's 101 kilopascals. And as you go up, I can never do this, I wish I could, would, was able to do this. Oh, that's not a bad curve, right? It asymptotes to zero. This, this pressure here is zero. KPM. So where we sit ha here we call zero gauge, but it's really 101 absolute. We need to use absolute pressures in the ideal gas law, and that's why we, we make the point of doing that. And this term here was the expression that we got last time. I won't repeat it, but we integrate this uh, behavior, but we have to account for the fact that density changes as a function of pressure. And so that's the, that's the difference in those. Okay. So that's kind of the recap from last time. My point of showing you this was that we ended up with these expressions by uh, deriving them. You won't need to derive them, but we will need to use them. For now, we'll use them in simplified form where accelerations are zero. And the two consequences of that are that pressures on a horizontal plane are, don't change. And that pressure change with elevation is proportional to the unit weight of that fluid at that point. So if you look at any point on this graph, even though this is changing elevation, so in other words, dP over dz is changing on this curve, it always satisfies this relation, because that's a fundamental relation. So we'll leave it at that. So uh, what are we doing today? I don't know what we're doing today. Let's, let me see what we're doing today. Oh yeah. We done, oh yeah, okay. All right, so we'll do a couple of things today, and they're marked on here. We'll ultimately get to measurement of pressures using manometry, and we'll talk about manometer rules. Maybe we'll come back then. Let's just kill this, uh, this, uh, this thing off related to compressible fluid. Uh, and I'll use the, the notes in here to do that. And so this is what we did last time. 
we ended up with this expression. I mean, we looked at it on equatio, and now I know how to change the color in equatio. But implicit in this, we did exactly what we did before. We used dpdz is equal to the unit weight, minus unit weight. We accommodated the fact that we could represent the compressibility or the density of the gas by the ideal gas equation. And we assumed that the temperature was constant. We've assumed that this value here is constant. That's not necessarily true. If you look in the atmosphere, um, I'm not going to belabor this, the reality is that the pressure in the atmosphere changes from room temperature, 20 degrees or 15 degrees on this particular diagram here. It changes from 15 here. And as you go up to the height of Everest, which is 10,000 meters, 10 kilometers, it's something like uh, minus 60. You know, if you've ever flown in a plane, um, you, often in the back of a seat, the seat back, you get temperature, pressure, wind speed, air speed, ground speed, uh, map. It'll tell you that when you're coming into, when you're 30,000 feet, which is 10,000 meters, it's about minus 60 uh, centigrade. Uh, interesting fact, minus 40 centigrade and minus 40 Fahrenheit are the same. That's the place where they cross over. If you've ever worked in a co cold climate, then you'll notice, know that. And so there's a difference here in temperature between here and 10,000 feet, and it would be 75 degrees centigrade. And that temperature changes over 10 to the 4 meters, right? So this is a little triangle that has those sides. 75 degrees centigrade by 10 to the 4. If you do the same as we did last time, but now you allow t not to be constant, so you could represent t just as a function. So t represents the t at atmospheric temp at the base, ta, and it equals some function as a function of z. Since these have to be in equivalent units, we know that the term, um, sorry, we know that, not the t that term, we know that the term beta has to be in units of dt dz, right? So if you substitute dt dz in for this, you end up with a temperature only, and this you add a temperature and a temperature. So we know exactly what the units of beta are. And so beta is just saying how temperature, how pressure, how temperature changes with elevation. And so dt dz in this particular case is just this. Or Kelvin, if you like, over 10 to the 4 meters, which is, to my, as I recall, 0, 0.00, oh, we're off the page, 0 0.0075 um, Kelvin per meter, or centigrade per meter, right, by the way. Just the ratio of these. And so the solution, if you do that, is exactly this. This is how pressure changes as a function of that. It's slightly different from the equation we had below, before. And in my diligence this morning, oh, is it still there? Oh, no, it's gone. Equation. Well, I'm not going to put it in, but I will instead do this. I'll make a recourse to, uh, you can see inside my well-ordered brain here. 2.3, oh no, not 2.3, that's Thursday's class, Friday's class. And you'll see the same video, well, you see this, there you go, that's good enough. So I lost equatio, but I'm not sure how, but, uh, but these are the two equations. So this is the one we had last time, exponential, this is for constant temperature, it's the red curve, and it goes up from atmospheric pressure here, all the way up to... Um, 10,000 feet. It's only true up to 10,000 feet, by the way, right? Because this is 20,000 meters, this is 10,000 meters. It's only true to 10,000 meters because the temperature changes in the atmosphere, you see. And if you look at the case where you allow temperature to change, you get the blue curve. <clears throat> so in other words, pressure changes more quickly. And so you have to rationalize whether you think that's true. Well, as you go up, it gets cooler. The air gets more dense because it gets cool, because you can show that from the ideal gas law. If it's more cool, then that mass of air that you have here is now compacted. And so you'd expect that the, um, the pressure would decrease more quickly as you go up because more of the air is closer to, to the ground. And so this is the case where you allow for temperature 
Red is the case where you ignore temperature. You assume that the temperature all the way up through the column is 20 degrees centigrade, I think we assumed last time. And they're not bad, right? So if you're at 10,000 feet, then it's either predicting um, 20,000 pas 20 kilopascals or 30. So it's 50% off. So it's, it's not inconsequential, but it's, a, it's something perhaps you have to adjust for in some cases and not in others. So you can show that there's some influence of that. All right, so that's enough for, for dealing with that. So, so um, yeah, okay, all right. Okay, so manometry. Well, let's, let's do this example first. I don't think I showed you this, but let's see Mrs. Um, scientist. I will be quiet. We looked at this already. Oh, I guess I won't be quiet because the, the noise, the, the volume's turned off. So we want to measure what atmospheric uh, pressure is. How do we do it? Well, we use a barometer, which is a manometer. And so you wear gloves because you don't want to get mercury on you. You certainly don't want to spill it over the floor as beadless because it's a hazardous substance and you have to get the hazmat crews in to clear it up. But you fill a, a column up with it. So the complete rod is filled. It's capped at the end. You fill it up to the top. You put your thumb over it. You immerse it in mercury. And then you look at the top of the tube. The top of the tube is separated because the weight of the mercury hanging on it has been has caused the, the mercury to change to a vapor. It's mercury vapor in there. And so if you know the vapor pressure of mercury, it now gives you a reference to be able to calculate what the, um, the pressure in the atmosphere is. And so she measured 71 centimeters of, of mercury. And so we can explore exactly how we might use that in terms of manometry. So manometry is a widely used technique to be able to, to measure pressures. Uh, physically, uh, there are better ways to do it now. Pressure gauges that are uh, piezoelectrics and are transducers. So manometry, piezoelectric, uh, so, so manometry, pressure transducers, now piezoelectrics are the way of the future for digital logging. But nonetheless, um, manometry has had its place in the past. And so the principle of a barometer is pretty straightforward. Um, we will use what we will call manometer rules. And we'll take care of the fact that at point B and B prime, because they are simply connected, I'll change my color here, because you can get from this point to this point completely through the fluid, even though they're on the same elevation, the pressures at these points have to be the same. So B and B plus have to be the same. A has to be at the pressure of the, uh, the vapor, the vapor pressure, a physical property. And we can also rationalize something that if we fill a box with fluid, so this is a bucket now, if we fill this up with water, we know that the pressure distribution in this is going to look like pressure is equal to gamma, I'll call it H, and of course H is this distance down here. So if this is water, then gamma is equal to rho g, which is equal to a thousand kilograms, is that too small, meters cubed, times g. And if it's water, so this is H2O, and if it's air, then rho, let's, let me get rid of the g because I didn't fill in that. Then rho is about one kilogram, it's about 1.25. Let's, let's not squint over that. So the point is that if you look at these two relations, they're three orders of magnitude different from each other. So if you drew the, the pressure due to water to scale, it would look like this. Sorry, air, this would be air. And so when we go down in a gas, we typically neglect the density because the changes are small compared to the liquids that are around it. So what we could do, we don't need to use that here, we can write a very simple expression. And that is, we could write the pressure at B, which we'd like to determine, as a function of the pressure at A. So what we need to do is we take the pressure at A, I'm gonna go back to red again just because I like red, more forceful. Pressure at A, uh, sorry, plus 
H gamma Hg is equal to Pb. You might have to take that on trust for now, but you could probably work it out, right? The pressure here is some magnitude. This is the vapor pressure of mercury, which is a constant. It turns out to be equal to 0 0.0025 atmospheres. And an atmosphere is 101 times 10 to the 3 newtons per meter squared, just atmospheric pressure. H we can measure. And so Pb is going to be the magnitude. So if we know this physical constant, we know what the measured height is in the barometer. We know the density and the unit weight of mercury. So the density of mercury is equal to 13,000 what is it? 600 kilograms per meter cubed, as opposed to water, well, which we have there, right? Which is 1,000. So it's 13 times as dense, roughly. This is mercury, Hg. And so if we know the unit weight, rho g, if we know the height, then we can measure what atmospheric pressure is and how it changes. And so we'd expect it to change as atmospheric pressure changes, as a high or a low passes over us. And so we can do the calculations for that, and we could calculate that, uh, what was it, 17 centimeters? Oh, that's my son. Uh, so we know we could calculate from this. Pressure A is equal to almost nothing. This is essentially zero. So the pressure B is going to be equal to uh, zero point seven, right? Seventy centimeters meters times one three six hundred kg a meters cubed times 9.81 meters per second squared. And that should be, I don't do the calculation, but 0.7 times 13,000 is about 10. This is about 10. And so this is, it'll turn out to be 100 times 10 to the 3 newtons per meter squared. You can check. That's, that's the basic calculation. And so we've ignored this vapor pressure because it's trivial compared to atmospheres in the system. Uh, you can show yourself that that's the case if you want. And so that's uh, how basically a, the barometer works um, to be able to define uh, the height of mercury. So it's 29.9 .9 inches of mercury or about 70 centimeters, about, about the same. So the reason that you use mercury is twofold. One is the vapor pressure of mercury is very low, and so you can just throw it away. So you can just ignore it. The vapor pressure of water is a bit higher, but not very much. The vapor pressure of water is 0 0.03 atmospheres instead of 0 0.0025. So it's 10 times larger, but it's still trivial compared to anything else. But the big change for water is that if water is 13 times less dense, you'd expect that the column would have to be 13 times taller. So if you want to measure things with a barometer, you have to have a, a tube that's as tall as your house, right? Three stories. This is three and a half stories. So that's the reason for that. So that brings, so I'll scoot, scoot back to our first page, because what we've done is we've done something without accommodating our ideas of manometer, what we'll call manometer rules. And they're written out in your notes, but I will talk to them and use my shorthand to describe them. So, to do what we've just done now, we need to be cognizant of what we'll call our manometer rules. We've kind of used them already without implicitly saying that. And that is if, if you go up in a column of water, you subtract the pressure. Right? We know that if you look at a column of water, if you go, if you go from this point here to this point here, you know that you're, the pressure is going to change by this amount and it's going to be negative. So my shorthand for negative is minus VE, 
My short time hand for positive is plus V. So if you go down in the column, pressure's increased. You know it from a swimming pool. So we're going to use these rules to be able to rationally calculate pressures in systems. If you go horizontally in a fluid and you can connect them, as we did in the monometer, B to B prime, without leaving the fluid, then the pressures at those two points are identical. So it doesn't matter if it's, if it's a U-tube, that you're going from point A here through the tube to a point on the other side. In fact, that's a great way to level a foundation. If you want to move a reference paint point in terms of uh, uh, an elevation across a garden or to get a foundation, you fill a 50-foot tube with water, and you have the elevation of the water in this place, and you have the same elevation of the water in the other place, if it's a see-through tube. Very easy. If it's evacuated, um, we use the vapor pressure. So if we vaporize the fluid, as we did in the top of the barometer, we use the vapor pressure of that fluid. And also, if it's a gas, we can probably assume that relative to a liquid, the density is small, and we don't care about those gradients. So in other words, if we have a balloon, a square, well, not a balloon, if we have the tank that we talked about before, and we looked at the change in pressure with depth, if it was water, yeah, we'd be interested to know the fact that it changes over this length. But compared to how the pressure would change for a gas in that same tank, it's inconsequential. And so we'll typically assume that gases, if the pressure here is the same pressure here, but you can't do that for a liquid, right? Red one is for a liquid, black one is for a gas. So, those, so these are very simply the rules that we'll use. So remember them, and they're all very rational. So if you go up in a fluid, you subtract pressures. Down in a fluid, you add pressures. If you go horizontally and can connect two points within the fluid without going out of the fluid, the pressures have to be the same. If you're in a place where you've turned the thing upside down and you have a vacuum in it, the minimum pressure there will be the vapor pressure of the um, fluid that underlies the gas. And if you go in a gas, you can, we could ignore the, um, the magnitude of the, of the density. Okay? So today and rest of today and tomorrow, we'll go through a bunch of examples on these. I know you haven't had so many examples right now, but we're at a stage to, to be able to do some of those. Very straightforward. I, well, so I've seen this 10 times. So I guess it's probably straightforward for me. So um, we looked on the first day at a collapsing dam at, a, at a, an iron ore mine in Brazil. You might want a big agent of that collapse are the pore pressures that are inside the dam. When they get high, they make it collapse. If you're an environmental systems engineer or a petroleum engineer, you typically want to measure pressures in the subsurface. Your reason you do that is because if you want to calculate the velocity as of fluids, um, the velocities of fluids are related to the pressure gradients. You don't need to know this now. This is permeability, this is viscosity, doesn't matter. But if you want to know how quickly a fluid goes, high pressure upstream, low pressure downstream, if you know that pressure and some properties as the permeability and the dynamic viscosity of the fluid, then you can calculate how quickly it flows, which is useful if you want to suck fluid out of the ground for water which of course, all the water in State College is groundwater that comes from the, all of it is groundwater, uh, absolutely all. So a piezometer is quite a normal uh, contraption. Uh, it's the same as a water well. And so the idea is that you work from the place where you know the pressure to the place where you want to know the pressure. So to get from P0, I'm gonna add H1 times the unit weight of the fluid. And that's going to equal PA. If we're working in uh, gauge pressures, atmospheric pressure here will be zero. And then this will be H times rho water, if you like, or oil, times G. And that will give you the pressure in the bottom. If we work in absolute, that would be 101 times 10 to the 3 newtons per meter squared. 
plus the same terms. H, rho, W. Is this small on the board or big enough? So these would be the two expressions. So if you want to write. And so the point is that you work your way using the manometer rules, right? We've gone downwards. So we've added a pressure to get to that point. And that's it. You can get more complicated than that. Um, this could be the bulb of the piezometer, or this could be a, um, a pipeline going into the page. That's what these circles are on these. They're really pipelines going into the page. So you might want to measure the pressure in a pipeline here. Same deal. If you want to know what the pressure is at this location here, probably, you work from the outside and going in. So you write the manometer equation. You could do it this way. This is a very complicated way of doing it, equating these two equations. Don't do it. But it's very simply pressure four. We're going down plus H2 times the unit weight of the fluid, the gauge fluid. I guess they call it gamma 2 here. That gets us to this point here. We know that if we go through the pipe and end up at the same level, the pressure P2 has to be the same here. So we can just do that. We can migrate from this point to this point. And now to get up to find the pressure at A, we have to subtract uh, H1 times the unit weight 1. That's it. In one step. So manometer rules are just kind of a recipe that you can use to work your way through the system. So you typically start at a place where you know the conditions. This, if we're working in gauge, is zero gauge pressure. It's easy to work in gauge. If you want to work in absolute, you can work at 101. If you know this elevation here, H2, and you know the gauge fluid density, it might be mercury or it might be water. It has to be a liquid, really, right, to be able to sit in here. And then this, this is the fluid that's present within the pipeline. This might be a gas in the pipeline, in which case, if it's a gas, then gamma 1 will be so small that we could actually throw it away, and it wouldn't make any change because of what we said about gases, uh, unit weight of gas basically being zero. And unit weight of liquids not being equal to zero. So this is gamma. OK, so that's it. So well, you'll see them written out here. Um, I don't think we'll go through that again, but because you've seen them, we've just defined them already. So lots of examples for you to follow. I'm not sure how many we have in here. Uh, all kinds. Uh, yeah. all right. All right. We've, got, we've got tons of time. Um, so same thing. So I mean, you can do it as a numerical example here. Uh, I can write it out in longhand. You want to know what the pressure is in this point. It's exactly the same one as before. Um, so what would you do? If you'd write this out, you'd write P atmosphere. It's, gonna, it's exactly the th same as the thing below. We want to go down to this point here, because this is where this one is on the bottom. right? Okay, here. So this length here is going to be plus 5 meters plus 2 meters, both multiplied by gamma red. That gets you to this point here. If it's, HUD, if it's mercury, then this is Hg. Um, you can go up um, 2 meters here, minus 2 meters times the unit weight of water and you know that from this point here these two points have to have the same pressures and that equals PA so, and hopefully that's what this is uh, here uh, PA oh 
I've done it the other way around. Um, of P atmosphere. Yeah, this is. It shouldn't be PA equals PA. This is atmospheric pressure here. And so P atmosphere is equal to zero. This would be equal to seven. And so I suppose if we wanted to simplify this, then the pressure A would be equal to seven times the unit weight of mercury minus two times the unit weight of water. Backwards? Sorry? I didn't cancel. So this, ignore, I'm not canceling this atmosphere. What's, which equation? This equation here? What's wrong with it? This is five meters here. And this is two meters here. And so, yeah, so that's right. So, so this is the expression that you end up with. So this is kind of what it is. And so you can work out, hopefully, what those are. Hopefully, I've got it right. Not, not guaranteed, of course. That's this. The reason that I'm putting this equal to 0 is because I'm taking the pressures relative to gauge pressure. This is zero pressure around me here. If I wanted an absolute, it would have to be 101 kilopascals. But here, if it's 0, then I'm not canceling it. I'm setting it equal to 0, and then calculating what the pressure within this container is. And it has to be this. And if you do it through using the right unit weights, this is uh, unit weight. So this would be uh, unit weight of water is 9.8 kilonewtons per meter cubed, of course, right? Because it's 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. times 9.81 meters per second squared. So a good number to remember. This I always take as 10. 10 kilonewtons per meters cubed. That's a, a good number to remember. And of course, instead of being 10, this is 133, so it's 13 times the density. This is Hg, no, actually the unit weight of Hg, mercury. And this is the unit weight of water. And it turns out the, the equation ends up with this. The other consequence, actually, for this, for today, um, is if I'm going to, I'll do, I'll do another one in a second, but while it comes to mind, the other interesting thing that you can do today related to the fact that Ida is floating around, Ida, Isa, is Ida, right? A lady's name. Is that this relationship that we know, we know that change in pressure with elevation, as you go horizontally, the pressure doesn't change. And we know that the change in pressure with elevation does change as equal to this, right? This is our compressible fluid. And so if you look at, say, drawing a section across the Gulf Coast from, I don't know, from southeast to northwest, then when the hurricane comes across here, it does a couple of things, right? It's spinning. This is the low. And this is the high that's out here. The high, as we found out before, was something like uh, one atmosphere. And I mentioned to you that a low is the lowest low in a hurricane has been 900 millibars. 900 one thousandths of a bar, so 0.9 atmospheres. And so if you look at working along that section, 
between um, a and a prime, say, I guess the section in the middle, we know that the atmospheric pressure is equal to, um, this would be 90 kilonewtons, and this would be 100 kilonewtons. This is one atmosphere. This is 900 millibars. So exactly from these two expressions, we can figure out what the storm surge might be if it's driven only by atmospheric pressure. We'd expect that if you have a water surface, it should look like this, then this height here would be, this needs to be um, 0 0.1 atmospheres. In the atmosphere, it's 0.9 atmospheres. If we go down, we have to get to one atmosphere because we know that it's one atmosphere over here. So this elevation here has to be equal to one atmosphere uh, or 10 kilonewtons. And we know that pressure is equal to H times unit weight. Unit weight of water is equal to 10 kilonewtons per meter cubed. This, we've just said, pressure at A has to be equal to 10 kilonewtons per meter squared. And so by definition, this has to be one meter. And so the storm surge that you'd expect to get by having a low sitting on the coastline is equal to a meter if it's just driven by the difference in atmospheric pressures acting on the sea surface. They have to be different. I mean, it looks stupid to have a, a sea that has a slope to it, but of course this is over many hundreds, you know, perhaps over 100 miles, and this is only a one meter over 100 kilometers. And so it's a very shallow gradient, but it has to be different nonetheless. So for Katrina, I think, uh, the storm surge was something of the order of 20 feet, which is uh, six meters. So clearly, for the lowest, deepest low that has given the deepest hurricane, the storm surge due to just the pressure change is only a meter, so it doesn't really account for the six meters. So you have to conclude from that, I think, that what's happening as the uh, storm comes on shore is that it's not being raised up by the fact that we just have this pressure gradient here, it's being raised up by the fact that you have uh, air coming in along the sea surface, which is basically pushing it like a bulldozer. Right? If you imagine dragging viscous fluid across the top, it's like our viscosity geometry that we looked at, it's dragging it across the top, it's kind of like a bulldozer. Pushing a bunch of sea in front of it. I guess I drove it back, uh, drew it backwards. But if you think about piling that fluid up against a wall, then you'd imagine that this is the moving wall, then this is the extra portion of the, um, of the storm surge that you see. So this is 20 meters. This is the one meter that we can get just by the pressure difference. It's not 20 meters, six meters. The rest of it has to be some, by some other process. I'm pretty sure the other process is by the fact that the, there's an onshore wind that's pushing it and piling up the fluid against the land. And of course, if you look at hurricanes and the statistics for um, hurricane events, people in hurricanes don't die from being swept out to sea and drowned. They're all freshwater drownings. So they're, as a result of the, the baseline level of the water in the sea being forced up, so rivers back up with the rain on land, the river water can't get out, and people drive their cars into it, and then they get into trouble that they shouldn't know. And of course, driving cars into it and then getting carried away is another fluid mechanics problem because it relates to buoyancy, right? So we'll, we'll talk about that in due course. So that, that was an aside. So let's go back to manometer. We've got five minutes. Maybe we'll do one more. Ex oh, we don't need to do another example. Uh, you can see the, the, the ways that this works. They all start looking the same at some stage. Um, uh, if you look here, the question is, I guess the question is, which one do you want to, to know the pressure in? 
In this particular case, you want to know the pressure in B, the way this is written, and so you just work your way through the system. You start at point A in this particular case. You, you assume that you know the pressure at point A. To get from point A to the next point, you go down, so you add. So this is a positive. H1 times the unit weight of the fluid in there. You end up at this point here. You can then go from this point in the fluid. I'll go outside the tube, but you know what I mean. If you go through the tube to get to this point here, then the pressure here has to be the same. Now, to go from this pressure to here, you go up, so you're subtracting. So you subtract H2 times the fluid that's in it. You're at this point here. Now you want to get to here. You're going up, and you're going up this amount here to this point, because this point is directly level with this. And that is going to be subtracting a height times the unit weight of this fluid. And that gives you the pressure at this point. Pressure at this point, because it's horizontally aligned to this, is the same pressure. And so we can get that, our last remaining pressure. So that's it. So. so if you wanted to, then, you could rearrange this, and you could define it in terms of the differential pressure between these two. So for instance, you might not know what A is, and you might not know what B is. If you don't know one of them, you can't tell what the other one is. But you could tell, for instance, the difference between them, because you have these two values that are in the equation. You can only get rid of one of them. You have an equation with two values in it. You can only make it a definitive one value if you know either PB or PA to, to solve for it. And so, so that's it. So that's it. So that's what manometry is. Uh, maybe we'll talk about that next. Yeah, we'll talk about this next time. Uh, we'll talk about pressure measurement devices, and we'll we'll do a bunch of examples next time. So there'll be plenty of time to do that. Any questions about what we've talked today?